I'm going to make this statement straight from the beginning because I predict that this is going to be one of those reviews where it'll be hard to parse whether or not I actually liked the game. Tactics Ogre, Let Us Cling Together, is one of the best Super Nintendo games. The Four Horsemen of holy shit SNES games goes Mario World, Super Metroid, Chrono Trigger, and this. In terms of just sheer... How did they accomplish so much with so little? Tactics Ogre has to be one of the most impressive games that I have ever played. It's also one of the most difficult. Seventh Saga, you have been dethroned. I think your claim on the most difficult SNES RPG was already kind of dubious, but... We have a new king in town regardless. One does not simply play Tactics Ogre. This is the kind of thing you enter a relationship with. You're like this with the game by the end of it. You make fucking sacrifices to play this thing. It takes a chunk out of you as well. This game is a black hole. It's a monster. You give it your time. You give it your attention. And it gives you nothing but your own self-indulgence just the ability to say that you've finished this game you get nothing else in return it's like you're at fucking war with the game i just kicked it you can't see that it's like you're at war with that thing so whenever i'm telling people that i'm doing tactics ogre i then have to explain that tactics ogre and ogre battle are not the same thing they're a part of the same series but they're radically different Battle is real-time, it's not grid-based, you're on a map, and with a cursor, you point to where you want your units to go. Think of any number of those PC-styled games where you click on where you want your units to go and they automatically fight it out. Same goes for Ogre Battle 64, same styled game. Tactics Ogre is more of a traditional strategy RPG. Think Fire Emblem, Shining Force, or of course most closely Final Fantasy Tactics. In fact, the resemblance here is uncanny because they were directed by the same guy, Yasumi Matsuno. After this game, Squaresoft poached him to make an incredibly similar game with the Final Fantasy branding. So Tactics Ogre and Ogre Battle are different games, but they're direct sequels to one another. In fact, the final boss of Tactics is literally the protagonist from Battle. They take place in the same world directly one after another. It's a little confusing so far, but it gets even more so when you consider the different versions of this game. Obviously, I played the Super Nintendo one, but there exists a PS1, a PSP, a Game Boy Advance, and modern versions of this game. The Game Boy Advance one is completely separate, that's its own thing, but the other ones are all varying degrees of remakes. I cannot speak to the PS1 or PSP editions, however, after finishing the SNES original, I replayed about a third of Reborn for the PS5, mostly because I happened to already own it, but also because I could not believe that they would keep the insane difficulty intact, and they did not. In fact, they fundamentally changed the mechanics so much that I almost can't even call this the same game. Most of said changes cut in the player's favor, and as a result, it's much easier. If you only played through the remake and think that I'm being hyperbolic about this game's difficulty, that's why. The math behind damage calculation is different, how experience points work is different, and if a unit is killed in the remake, it's like in Fortnite or something, where they're just kind of temporarily knocked down until a teammate revives them. None of that shit is in the original. If a unit is defeated, it's dead. You either restart the fight or you go on without them. Shockingly, the remake reused the same sprites, but with a modern presentation where you can move the camera around. A nice feature, but they also put this nasty blur filter over everything, and honestly, I prefer the sharp pixels of the Super Nintendo. The new one is much faster as well, which alone makes Reborn much less of an ordeal. Because that's what Tactics Ogre is. An ordeal. I really didn't want to play Tactics Ogre. I really didn't. 
Mostly because I hated Ogre Battle. I hated that game to the point where it might have been my least favorite Super Nintendo RPG. Now, I'm not saying it's the worst. I'm not saying it's the worst. Don't take that the wrong way. It's clearly not the worst, but it might have been my least favorite. That, and I didn't want to play this because I don't look forward to playing strategy RPGs for the show. Because they are all slow-paced. They're all overly long. They end up being these huge commitments. And playing a strategy RPG for the show means that for the next few weeks, this is going to be my whole life. Looking at this, well, this isn't the battle screen. But looking at this stupid game is going to be my whole life for a few weeks. And Tactics Ogre ended up validating all of my fears. It was everything I thought it could be. Like, in the worst way... And then some. Is this game slow paced? The slowest paced. Is this game overly long? Yes. I, this is the game that doesn't end. I thought on four separate occasions I was fighting the final boss. Only for the game to keep on going. And going and going and going and going. The game never ends. All right, enough preamble. Let's talk about the darn game. As you can see, it's an isometric strategy RPG where you and your opponent take turns moving your units around. And my first impressions sucked because nobody would shut the hell up. This is a common strategy RPG complaint I have. They tend to give you way too much information far too quickly. The opening cutscene goes over a bunch of different countries and characters, which your first time playing means nothing and I don't end up internalizing any of it. My philosophy when it comes to this sort of thing is that the story should start simple and then maybe end complex if you have the stones. Look at Final Fantasy 3. Starts with three robots walking in the snow. Chrono Trigger starts with you going on a date at the fair. Then as these games go on, you slowly learn details about the world around you until eventually everything falls into place and you have this complex web of characters and events going on. But why is it that tactical RPGs in particular feel the need to tell you the history of the universe before you actually start playing the game? Tactics Ogre manages to do the exact opposite of my ideal story in that it starts complex and becomes progressively simpler as the various warring factions are defeated until eventually the final chapter consists of my party single-handedly one by one beheading each of the game's villains until the protagonist of the last game rises from his grave to kick my ass repeatedly. Not to say that the story doesn't work or have its moments, but I enjoyed it much more when it was about the personal drama than about the larger, broader war you're engaging in. It has all of the esoteric, out-of-your-way storytelling that Battle had, where in that game you had to be a CSI private investigator to even know what it was about. Tactics Ogre, thank God, is much more cut and dry when it comes to its meat and potatoes. There are as many details as you want to find. The game has a built-in way to replay cutscenes, for goodness sake, which is unheard of in a Super Nintendo game, and I can't think of a single other one which does that. You're supposed to comb over them, look for finer details, close read them, like in a college course. There's this thing called the Warren Report, which is like a constantly updating recap of the story so far. But what's interesting is that it's from the perspective of like an in-universe newspaper. If you're not currently popular at this point in the story, there's a stretch of game, for example, where you're on the run as an outlaw. All the news stories will be slanted against you. This whole thing, or just game recapping mechanisms in general, they weren't a thing back then, or at least I can't think of any other 1995 games which have anything like this. They also hid an inordinate amount of secrets in here. For example, the Warren Report might alert you to some thief in some out-of-the-way town, where if you go there, you'll find a recruitable party member. Basic example, but they're dropping hints for their own secrets all over this thing. It's so forward-thinking that if I had played the remake first, I would have been convinced that the Warren Report was added for that, but no, it was here all along. Tactics strikes a great balance. Secrets are discoverable if you look, but they're not required to understand the game. The plot itself is not hidden by behind these walls, and you don't have to read the Warren Report to understand what's going on. Speaking of, what is this game actually about? Well, there's a civil war, the land is divided among ethnic lines, you've got the Backrum, the Gargantstans, and the Wallasta, the Walsta. 
which is what you are, at least until a late game plot reveal. You're incredibly, creepily close to your sister. Seriously, it reads as if it was written as a romance before being changed. Sort of like Luke and Leia in Star Wars. The fan translators even borrow some lines from Star Wars. Search your feelings, you know it to be true. The Duke of your faction has been captured, and the first segment of this game is you and your sister tagging along with a more experienced established army to go rescue him. The first few battles, you're only in control of yourself, and you're pretty worthless as a unit. It's basically just your CPU-controlled allies slaughtering the enemy while you contribute some chip damage here and there. It's a great way to contextualize a tutorial. Instead of giving you full reins over an entire team right away, you roleplay as one specific unit. Well, the game basically shows you how it plays with itself. This is how it's done. The CPU systematically dismantles the enemy, and you learn how it's done through them. Plus, it shows us how the protagonists earn their stripes. His first few fights are why he's trusted to lead his unit after the Duke is freed. Usually in these types of games, you're the commander under the flimsiest of pretenses. That's if they even bother you to give you a reason beyond it being a video game. The isometric cubert styled controls take a couple fights to get used to, but luckily it's turn and not action based. Plus, if it bothers you that much, there are other control options. Next, you do some errands for Duke Ronway until eventually you go on a mission where you're ordered to genocide this entire town. They don't tell you straight away that that's the plan. They send you out there and only once you're there tell you to do it as sort of like a loyalty test. The Duke's idea is to kill the whole town so you can blame it on your enemies to gain more support for the war because currently people are mostly apathetic about this whole ethnic war thing. And it's here that we come to our first branching path. You can choose to go along with this, but what are you, a monster? Nobody would do that. Including me, I refused. But the Duke sent another army behind us to carry out the task instead, so the genocide still happens even if it's not by our hand. They then blame the whole thing on you and you spend a large chunk of the game on the run as an outlaw. Meanwhile, his crazy plan actually worked as intended, so support for the war effort increases rapidly after that. And these aren't just artificial branching paths. These are true branching paths. It changes up more than just a few cutscenes. Everything is different. The battles, what characters you interact with, who the good guys are, who the bad guys are. Everything changes depending on which route you choose. When all this goes down is a great fight too. You battle your way downhill into this town. Then when you refuse to kill everyone, you're forced to fight your way back out the same map, uphill. Verticality matters in Tactics Ogre. There's a whole physics system as to what you're able to target. If you have a bow and arrow and the range only shows a certain distance, you can actually hit units far beyond that range if you have the height advantage. Walls and buildings also matter. You can use them for cover because long range attacks will bounce off. There's friendly fire too, like if one of your units is in the way of the enemy, you can't shoot them from a distance because you'll just end up hurting your ally instead. I think the most impressive are the guns. Yeah, I said guns. You know this game had gosh darn guns? And I'm not talking about your character's biceps. They're introduced almost at the very end of the game and they make a huge deal out of it. They're actually a plot detail as well. A boat from another continent shipwrecked, and among the ruins they found guns. Your enemies have been behind the scenes quabbling over them ever since. Guns are overpowered as hell. They have unlimited range. You can target anyone anywhere on the map. They do more damage than almost any other weapon. There's only a couple of them in the whole game. They're still blocked by walls. But even so, they're like an in-game cheat code. Tactics Ogre turns from a basic Tolkien-esque medieval fantasy to an XCOM cover shooter. Your battles become like the Seven Samurai, where they base their strategy around how many guns the opponent has access to. It is a fantastic curveball to throw at you so late in the game. Adds a wrinkle to both its gameplay and plot, and is something that I never could have realistically predicted. It has real-world analogs and suggests that, hey, we're just this shitty country having a civil war inside of a larger world. That's another thing. This whole ethnic civil war. Everybody looks the same. 
from an outsider's perspective, aka the player's perspective, this whole thing is really stupid. Everyone seems to be fighting for their own nationalist or ethnic interests, but you peel back the layer of being emotionally involved, and you realize that everyone's the fucking same, so who cares? Your war is stupid and I reject it. This brings us to our second branching path. You're given a choice to join back up with the Duke, with the logic being that you're of the same ethnicity, so really you should be focusing your attention on the filthy back room. To that I said, fuck you, you just spent the whole last chapter trying to kill me, and I want nothing to do with your stupid army. If you're a super fan of the game, I'll tell you that I ended up doing what is known as the chaos route, and I got the good ending. I did end up using a guide because some scene later on played out in a way that I knew could not have been correct. Not to recap the whole story, but your sister turns emo, joins the other team, and then after a big confrontation with her army, instead of just joining back up with you, she fucking stabs herself in the chest and dies. Of course this can be prevented, you just have to choose a very specific set of dialogue options beforehand. So I did about three quarters of the game without a guide, and I missed everything up until that point. This is a game with secrets built on top of each other. They're as cryptic as sell a certain number of potions to the store so you can go to some other town to meet a random guy who joins your team. The type of shit you're not going to figure out on your own, most likely. I'm also glad I did because it's the kind of game where 90% of players are going to get the bad ending if they play through it completely blind. Me included, I would have. The story is probably not earth shattering, but it actually got me to care, which is the metric I use to judge these things. And I think a large part of this are that the cutscenes mostly take place using in-fight graphics as opposed to on the world map or in a disconnected face portrait realm in some ethereal void. No, the battlefield structure is applied to every location. If we physically see it, then it could have been a battlefield. There will be war room meetings at a table, characters will have subtle emotes, a cornucopia of minor details in these scenes really sell their ideas. In something like Fire Emblem, we'll get exposition dumps in between chapters, disconnected from the actual game, but it's all grounded in Tactics Ogre. I value that. You know, I don't think I ever really could have placed what bugged me about most of Fire Emblem's storytelling, but I think that this game made me realize that it's partially because of this disconnect. I couldn't tell you what was wrong until I saw another game do it right. Tactics Ogre is also one of those games where the universe doesn't revolve around you. I'm sure that there's a term for this, but in most games, every single action which happens, happens directly to you. As in, everything outside of your purview stops almost as if time freezes for the rest of the world when you're not involved. Not so here. Things happen to other characters while you are not present, and this game's branching paths allow you to see different angles, different events, their windows into the things that you missed in one route. Shoot on the box, it says Ogre Battle Saga Episode 7. What, did George Lucas write this game? Was Ogre Battle supposed to be chapters 1 through 6? They clearly want you to feel like this is one part of an overall larger ongoing conflict, and the bad ending actually plays into this. That one ends with you becoming king and then immediately getting assassinated. So the bad outcome is like the war didn't even really end. I think the best example of this is the character Vice. He's a childhood friend of the protagonist, he's with you from the beginning of the game, but even after being put in charge of your own army, he never listens to you. He's a computer-controlled NPC ally, and just kinda does his own thing. His deal is he sides with Ronway when you're ordered to murder that town, so he has his own separate rise to prominence within their ranks. And you know where this is going. Of course, we're gonna have an epic showdown later, possibly as him as the final boss. And we do, we do have an epic showdown. And it's fucking one-on-one. -on -one. Oh my god. A strategy RPG with a one-on-one -on -one boss fight. That's genius. It might be the most memorable encounter in the entire game. Especially with a fight this personal. In fact, the game pulled this trick twice in the route I took. And I marked the hell out both times. Vice is cocky, he's a snake, intermixed with our own adventures we see cutscenes of him conniving and politicizing his way up the military ladder, then we have our one-on-one -on -one fight, 
but it's not to the death as we're interrupted. As it becomes clear that you are going to become the new leader of the Wolasta, he defects from you again. This time he tries endearing himself to the other ethnic groups, but it leads to him being executed while shouting out for your help. Powerful stuff. He dies not by our hand, but looking for our assistance. He also wanted to bang your sister, so fuck him. He got what he deserved. I love how fights match the severity of the situation. Opponents don't always fight to the death, it's story dependent. The one-on-one -on -one against Vice, for instance, or another example is a bounty hunter chasing you down. You kill a few of his units and then he runs away and the battle ends. This person didn't have a blood feud with you, they were doing it for money. Once it becomes clear that they're not going to win, they run away. And I like that. Why is everyone always so eager to die in every other game? Here's a nasty ambush with a bounty hunter that led to many a reset. You and your sister start in the center of town while your party starts all the way over here. It's a race to get back to your team before either one of you are slaughtered, and it was a real bitch to protect both of them. The previous record for longest Super Nintendo RPG on this show was Uncharted Waters New Horizons at around 73-ish hours. I don't remember the exact amount. And let me tell you, Tactics Ogre completely blew it away. Completely blew it away. Now, unfortunately, when I was working on this video, I had a hard drive crash. So normally the way I do this is I just, I count up all my gameplay sessions, how long they took, and that's how I get the how long to beat figure. But I lost so much of my gameplay that I it's impossible for me to do that this time. But, like, it... It had to have been around 100 hours. It was so gosh darn long. How long to beat claims that this game's only 44 hours. And, I, like, maybe if you already know everything and on a replay, maybe if you're playing on ZSNES and you hold down fast forward the whole time, then maybe it's a 44-hour game. But, holy shit, on a blind playthrough, there is no way. No way. Maybe the remake. Maybe the remake is 44 hours. But like the original, no fast forward, ain't no way, man. This game is difficult for a variety of reasons, but I think it mostly stems from it playing like a Shining Force styled game while retaining Fire Emblem's permadeath. What do I mean by that? In Fire Emblem, you're able to move every single one of your units all at once. Then the opponent moves all theirs in the same round. Then you take turns controlling everyone at once. But in Shining Force, your speed stat determines what order the characters move in and how often they're able to go. You only get to move one person at a time, and unless you're really good at counting cards, you never know who's going to get to move next. As a result, it's impossible to plan for specific moves. You just kind of have to roll with the punches and take what the game gives you. And in Shining Force, it's fine because that game is dog easy. But here, no. It's just as brutal as any Fire Emblem. The AI has a nose for blood. They know this game has permadeath and as a result will gang rape your weakest link. Because hey, we're not playing to win the battle. We're playing to cripple you as much as possible. You left your cleric or under-leveled character, you're just trying to get up to speed for the rest of the team. You left them one square within the enemy's range. If they turn around and use all of their movement squares to get to you, well, fuck you, they're dead. In Fire Emblem, you can plan for this because everybody moves at once. Here, you don't really have any idea when that character is able to move again, so you never really know where is safe. These are things the remake addressed by both mitigating permadeath and actually showing you the move order at the bottom of the screen, but here on Super Nintendo you're flying blind. After a while I got a sense, but I never knew exactly the turn order. When a character dies you have a tough decision to make. Do you reset the fight or do you keep going without them? You're able to recruit new characters in almost every town, so you might be tempted to just let units die every fight, but there's a major catch. New recruits always join at level 1. Yeah. They're beyond worthless. 
Level 1 characters can't even get cheap damage off because their accuracy stat is too low to hit anyone with ranged attacks, and if you try a direct strike, they'll always die to the counterattack. So how are we supposed to use them? Even at the start of the game when you're first given your own army, level 1 is too weak to not get instantly slaughtered. This leads me into one of the strangest mechanics, the practice mode. You can host these intramural training sessions between the members of your team. So you're only allowed to bring 10 units at a time into battle, but you can have up to 30 on your team at any time. It doesn't matter how urgent the story events are. As long as you're on the world map and not like inside of a fight or a castle, you can just have your team fight itself. Permadeath is turned off, but you still gain experience points. Knowing this, you have to manufacture scenarios where these low-level characters are actually able to contribute. For instance, you can turn somebody to stone, because when somebody's turned to stone, everything always has a 100% accuracy, and when they're a statue, they can't counterattack either. So you turn somebody to stone, and then have your level 1 characters just wail on the person who's turned into stone, and that's the most consistent way to get them up to speed. It takes time, it takes effort, it takes plan. What's really strange about this training feature is that it acts as sort of a backdoor multiplayer option. You can set it up as a player versus computer, a player versus player, or even a computer versus computer battle? Yeah, you can have the game play itself, which I did often. This was by far the option I choose the most. Whenever I wasn't actively playing this game, I would set it up to play itself. You still keep the experience points and you don't have to do a thing. This might sound like cheating, but trust me, it's not. The game expects you to grind. This isn't the kind of RPG that's balanced to where you'll always be on the same level as your opponent. If you don't do this, you'll always be fighting uphill. What I like to do is take the weapons from everyone so the battles would last longer. Grinding in this game is like doing laundry. You check in on it every half hour or so. It doesn't work as well as you might think anyway. Eventually everyone starts only gaining 1 EXP each, and even this hands-off grinding becomes not worth it. Experience works different in the remake, in that the whole party gains an equal amount all at once at the end of the battle, but not here in the original. It's on a character-by-character -character basis. You don't gain EXP unless you actually harm the enemy. You're only allowed to have 10 units at a time inside of battle, but this system encourages you to have a built-in JV team with 10 more, at least, competent units sitting on the bench for training purposes. Having backup units also comes in handy for the marathon battles, which allow you to swap out units in between fights. For example, a common tactic this game employs is some kind of storming the castle scenario, where you'll have a fight on the outside, barging into the castle, then you're given an option to change up the active members of your team without having the ability to save or anything else. This is not a checkpoint, it's just an opportunity to switch characters before proceeding with another fight inside of the castle you just stormed. For most of the game, these are used to emphasize important story battles, to give the moment a little more oomph. A nice little two-part battle to end a chapter. Then late game, they start throwing three-part battles your way, which are a little much. Remember, no saving or checkpoints in between, so if a character dies in part three of a battle, resetting would mean that you need to do all three again. There is a cheese to the whole permadeath mechanic. There is a revive spell in this game, but you can't buy it in stores, and I only found one, and only one of my units was able to use it, and it costs a shitload of MP, so it's really not friendly to use. You can, and what I did often was at the end of the battle, say the enemy only had one unit left, I would just waste time regenerating MP until I was able to revive everybody that died. This is something I had to do in some of the last chapters in this game, or else I never would have made it through. It ain't easy being cheesy sometimes. During these multi-part battles, it's a trick you're gonna need. I'm at the end of chapter 4. We're one battle away from ending the war. In cutscenes, your characters have even been saying shit like, this will be the final battle, and it's a three-parter. Every bit as epic as it should be. These knights are ready to make their last stand. We might lose. I will not force you to fight. Whoever does not want to die may leave now. Go ahead, now. Very good. 
the Bakram Knights are honorable. The war has long since turned in your favor. The enemy knows they're going to lose. You have inside cabinet members of the opposing king running away on him. Those loyal are making their last stand. It has every bit the markings of the end of the game, except no. Because those guys who ran away are after the pirate's gold and went to the top of some big dumb tower, where you then have to climb after them. It's called the Tower of Eden, but I just call it the fucking tower. It came out of absolute nowhere, but whatever. Guess how many fucking parts the tower battle comes in? Up until this point, three-parters were stretching the limit of what's feasible of accomplishing without everyone dying. You don't get your health or magic refilled between battles or anything. Four parts? Maybe five? Six? No, that can't be right. The tower can't have six battles, right? No, that would just be absurd. Six battles without saving or having access to a shop or a town or the ability to train or anything? There's no way it could be as high as six. Hmm. I wonder how many battles this tower could have. Ah, hmm. Did you guess? How about... Fucking nine! Nine! What the fuck, game? You see why now it's important to have more than 10 good party members? Nine battles back to 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 back. How many was that? Oh, I need one more. To back. Wow. The end of this game shows absolutely no mercy. Admittedly, it's not that bad, because most of these fights are pretty easy. But imagine fucking up in the ninth fight, losing like a crucial unit, the only mage who can revive people, and then you gotta restart the whole thing from the beginning again. And if you thought the game was over after that, no, 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 no. Not by a long shot. You're given a save point, finally, after nine battles, but there's still no shop or training access. You lose those privileges before entering the fucking tower. This is your last opportunity to save, and there's a four-part battle left. The first two stages are pretty unremarkable. You just fight some normal enemies, and they're not that tough. But the one-two punch they saved for last are contenders for the most difficult end bosses in RPG history. Let's start with these assholes. It's all RNG. You fight them two on ten, but it's like that ambush earlier where you start right in front of them while your team is all the way across the map. These motherfuckers are like when you watch a Summoning Salt speedrun video and they're playing one of those games where a run can just end because you got unlucky. Because the first couple of turns can go one of two ways. Both enemy units will always get to move first, but the developers placed you one square just out of reach of this guy here. What happens first is every single time this guy will hit you, and there's a random chance in this game that when taking damage directly like this, of getting knocked backwards. If that happens, you lose. Good day, sir. You get nothing. Because the other guy just comes over and will deal enough damage to kill you without fail. But if you manage to hold your own ground and are allowed to actually continue the fight, I never lost or even had a unit die if the protagonist managed to survive these turns. Because it is, after all, 10 on 2. You just kind of gang up on them. It's stupid. Straight up RNG check. After that, the final boss against the Zombie King, the protagonist from the first game, rises from his Jason grave, summons these shadow monsters, and then tears you a new asshole because he's comedically overpowered compared to everything else in this game. He has an ass load of HP, his defenses are so high that I only have a couple units which are actually able to hurt him for more than one damage. He revives his dead teammates, he has the nastiest AoE spell that has no range, targets every single one of your units, and deals enough damage that it's a two-hit knockout on everyone. If he decides to use this attack two times in a row, you lose. That's it. You can try and heal, but you're also dealing with all this other shit, so I just kept getting overwhelmed. This is an empty the shelves, every item you've been saving because they're too good to use, whip them out. You need to have a very specific plan to make this magic happen. For me, it was exploiting the final boss's revive spell. Every turn the zombie king spends reviving his dead teammates is a turn he's not fucking attacking me. So 
What ended up eventually working was a two-pronged attack. My units, actually capable of dealing damage, chased him around the battlefield, attacking him every chance they got, while the rest of the team was to aggro whatever the enemy's lowest HP monster was. Now, the Zombie King doesn't always revive dead units when he can, but keeping it in his Rolodex was imperative, because him attacking my team 100% of the time, as opposed to two-thirds of the time, makes a huge difference. I had units with no weapons or armor holding MP restoring items for the sole purpose of keeping my mages juiced up, because you need to have the best healing magic just to survive. I also tried to turn as many of the enemy's monsters to stone as possible. They're resistant to the status, but they're not immune. Sometimes you can get a petrify through, and that status effect rules the world in this game. I already mentioned how it immobilizes and makes it so you hit them 100% of the time, but why it's really good is because it's permanent in this game unless you or the enemy has a way to heal them, which in this particular battle, they do not. But eventually I made it through, barely. Seven of my units died, but the two which matter did not, me and my sister. The good ending sees your sister become the new queen, uniting the entire continent, and living happily ever after. Holy shit. Jesus Christ. I will never call Fire Emblem difficult again. It was a regular occurrence for me to sit down, play this game for three hours, and make absolutely no progress, because I'd spend the entire time resetting the same battle over and over and over again. The final gauntlet was grueling. I would get so frustratingly close on a number of occasions, but if you save right beforehand, you're trapped. There's no way to back out and grind more, so the final boss caught me with my pants down, probably a level or two under where they expected me to be. If you are the type of person who likes to obsess over one game, then Tactics Ogre is a prime candidate. It's deep. It's hard as fuck, it has multiple paths, there's a million and one secrets, it's overall incredibly well made. It's a great game, it really is. There's a lot of annoying things, or just kind of pricks in it, but you know what they say. Every rose has its thorns, it just so happens that tactics ogres will cut your arms off. Anyway, that's all I got. Never trust anyone who needs a haircut. Shout out to the patrons. Shout out to William Robert Lee. I did that in the wrong order. Goodbye.